Welcome to another installment of Believe in Chargers uh, with the all-decade, all-pro, uh, arguably greatest fullback of his era, Lorenzo Neal, a San Diego Charger favorite and now a Los Angeles Charger favorite. We'll get into that. What a great celebration uh, they had down at Camp Pendleton earlier this week, something you're certainly familiar with, Low. But first, a big thank you to all of you. Uh, we appreciate you subscribing sharing, commenting, reviewing. If you can do that little extra bit, it helps us a lot. The comments help push the pod. The reviews help push the pod into the way these algorithms work and spread the word about what we're doing here as we're still relatively new. So thank you, all of you. And uh, remember, Believe TV is on around the airports. You might see our uh, ugly mugs as the last thing before you, you hop into the tin can and start cruising at 38,000 feet. But uh, it's been a pleasure so far, Low, as the offseason continues. And this is this week is our last bit of action. Next week will be our final reaction pod to kind of what's going on on the field before these guys take their six weeks. And, and something certainly that, that you can speak to about how great, you know, you do the mandatory minicamp and then you end up with six, seven weeks to just clear your mind, be with your families before it really gets rolling. No question, Monday. I absolutely love that six to seven week period where it's dead time because I would come in and you're like, okay, you look good at the last OTAs in the last training camp, but I'm going to tell you right now, me, money, you remember those days when I came into camp, it was another 10 pounds of shredded. I, they were like, what did you do in six weeks? How did you do that? I go, My body fat would go from like frigging 16 or 15 down to like the 10 or nine. I mean, it was absolutely, that was the time, that six weeks, I made so many gains. I started working two and three times a day, getting back to Fresno State and wrestling. I think that offseason, that six weeks, yes, you can still relax. Yes, you can, but you have to re relax, but do still be working. And I think that for me, that was that's when I made my biggest gains those six weeks. Now, wait a minute. You just said something there. You said you would go back to Fresno State and wrestle. Yes. So, so you're you're wrestling Division One athletes, Central California, <laughs> strong as ox farm dudes, and so there. That's one side of it, right? These dudes yes. have been training to wrestle. Then you're gonna yes. you're gonna hop on the mat, put on your headgear, you're singing, yes. you're gonna get in there. With Absolutely. Them. But then the flip side of that is they're like, what "The hell is this? I gotta get on a mat with Lorenzo Neal? Out of your freaking mind!" I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll with my my 19 year old that, that has not built any man strength yet. Who are you? Who who are you? Uh, like who are you wrestling? And and what like what weight class? How, walk us through. Yeah, this. You're, you're like you're like whoa whoa you confused yeah. me there whoa what? no it's interesting because Dennis Delito was a wrestling coach in the summertime I would just go over to the wrestling room I say hey, get a couple guys and roll around stand up takedowns working on the defensive positions and it just helped my motion range of motion flexibility and the guys would take it easy it was just drilling getting in some you know some tough situations getting your body think about football how many times you've seen guys get in so crazy positions you think they're going to break a leg and all of a sudden you see them come out of it that's what it was me with fullback I was in some crazy positions the wrestling put you in those compromising right. positions, but also you're wrestling with a guy 230, 240, guys 190. So it helps with your change of direction. They're trying to shoot a single, a sweeping single. I have to sprawl. So it just helped me with my footwork, accountability. So I love going wrestling. Then I'd get out in this 110 degrees here in Fresno, and I would go over to Woodrow Park and run the hills. I got some hills already designed. Every now and then, money, I'll still get out there and run a couple of them hills. Just a couple, not a lot. There we go. Now listen, uh, it's a big week for you. Uh, last two weeks, I should say, inducted into the, the Fresno State Wrestling Hall of Fame. So a huge congratulations there. Thank you. Um, and that's great. And and you were an exceptional wrestler, a champion wrestler. Every I, I have humility, but every now and then I like to puff my chest out. I would like to point out, while those accomplishments are many and appreciated, in sixth every grade, yeah. I happened to, to wrestle uh, the Hammond, Indiana, uh, 70 pounds and under weight what? class and uh, was able to make it to the finals in which I was, um, I believe the match lasted somewhere between six and eight seconds. And when I was pinned immediately <laughs> by my opponent from Spohn, now, mind you, I'm in sixth grade. My, uh, my coach told me that's the most disappointing effort I've ever seen on a wrestling match. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, he can't tell you that. You're in the sixth grade. You're wrestling coach. You made it to the finals, money. He right. cannot tell you that's disappointing. Yep. It gets better. It gets better. 
I am. Uh, however, what what is it? What is this sixth grader? You're you're eleven. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I was when when we did the weigh in. You know, again, I'm seventy pounds and under. So imagine what I look like already. Oh, yeah. You know, screen bean in my tidy whities yes. on the scale. I'm at seventy one pounds. The the two days before the weigh in, and he freaks out. Because there's nobody on the team that's remotely as small as I am. I I am the 70 pounds and under category. He wants the title that, you know how it goes at these meets, right? Sure. He sends me home with an empty gallon of milk and a bag of lemons. And he says, you are going to sit in front of the TV tonight. And you are going to squeeze these lemons into your mouth. And you are going to spit. No. You're going to fill up this gallon of jug the night before I had to weigh in. So I had to do that. To get down, my grandma's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I gotta make weight, Graham." Come on, me, money. This is great. You never told me this story, so you're yeah. trying to cut weight. You're spitting, chewing the lemons. Oh, yeah. I, I've been there. I've been there, money. I've been oh, yeah. there. I made weight. I, I clocked in at sixty nine pounds. Didn't have to take the underwear off. Was able still to clock in at sixty nine. <laughs> Uh, I go to wrestle and, and honest, like if I'm being honest, I think the match might have taken 35 seconds. Uh, Do you think it was you dehydrated because you were starving? Do you think that guy had something? No, oh God, no. He was, he was better than me, Lo. He okay. was, I was very, uh, I was very loud and swain. I was a little yeah. bit, you know, taller and lankier and he was just a little fire hydrant guy yeah. might've been like four foot five okay. and just stocky and, uh, I kind of went in, I, I got my hand in the armpit there and, and the hand on the, uh, on the head. And I was trying yeah. to, and he just shot me low, scooped me up. And that was that. Boom. Pancakes. It's the most Pancakes. exploding effort I've ever seen on a wrestling match, son. <laughs> <laughs> but it was in the, hey, but Matt, it was to your credit. It was in the yeah. final. Yeah, it was it in the final. So you got to realize this guy, it wasn't like it was just the first match. You got <laughs> stuck. You're not a fish. No. You no. made it to the finals, yeah. money. You made it to the yeah. finals. Thank you know, be you. proud. Be proud. I appreciate that. Again, I side I, that was way too long of a story for uh, for the pod because your sporting career is considerably more impressive. So let's let's get back to that because it is not everybody goes home and does that. Low, not not everyone is. Am I right? Like, what percentage no. of guys go for six weeks and don't do anything? What is the expectation from the coaching staff that these? What are these guys supposed to do? And what will the majority of them do over these next six weeks? I'll, I'll tell you what. A lot of these guys will work. Uh, there's not a lot of, I mean, one guy, there's a couple guys, might, you know, you might, everybody might take a, a four day vacation, but on their vacation, they're working. They're at the beach. They're working. Guys understand the importance. They understand what's coming up. And yes, you still can go freaking the Bahamas and go on a vacation, drink a couple of Mai Tais, but you still can work out. So coach wants them to get away from football. I get that part of it. But these guys, you have to work out. You can't take two and three weeks off and say, I'm just going to wait to training camp. Those days are over. That's a long time. Yesterday, years. You have this offseason, this part, this six weeks. It's very important because you think about it the first day or the second day, you're in pads. You'd be a fool not to go out and say, look, I'm going to be I'm not going to work out. I'm going to just wait these six weeks and come back in and say and lose everything that you had. So this is a, a time that a lot of guys that go see the strength coach, the strength coach will give them a six week program that they can follow. And a lot of guys just do extra they go out there, they're playing hoop, they're playing basketball, they're running on their own. Some guys are still meeting at the, at, at the facility or other places at school. I imagine Justin's still going to meet with some of the receivers, get some extra work in, because this is what it takes to be a leader. This is what it takes to go ahead and say, we want to be a championship type of team. So I think, yes, Harbaugh's telling them, hey, guys, take some time off. Go be with your family. I understand that. But when he says take time, off, it's away from the facility. It's away from the coaching staff. But it's not away from getting being prepared to play a tough season this year. So, Lo, this, uh, this mandatory minicamp, 100% participation. All, all the guys that were gone, Gus Edwards, Will Disley, J.K. Dobbins. I think we had five missing. No more. Uh, 100% participation for mandatory minicamp. Um just going through your career, the different coaches you played for, the different places you played, is that normal? Does that signal something? Uh, was it different for disciplinarian coaches like Marty Schottenheimer? Like, how did it all sort of shake out over the course of your career? Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about OTAs and you say how, how important is it for the team and the bonding and all those different things. You know what? I don't know. I know when you have a good team, it's pretty good. If you have a bad team, you tell me, because I've been on some pretty good teams and I've been on some pretty bad teams. Let's start with a guy by the name of playoffs. You know who that is? Jim, you know, Jim Moore. 
did more with the Saints. You know, we had OTAs. Guys still would, you know, show up. You'd have during your 100% or 100% participation because you know Jim Moore is that type of guy in your face, a tough coach. And, uh, you know, we still went, you know, 2-15, and 2-14. So, <laughs> so, so you, you know, you know, money. So I, I don't know. if you. It comes down to X's and O's and it comes down to players. I had, a, you know, another coach that was, that was really tough, Bill Parcells with the Jets. He wanted guys at OTAs, very, very important. And you knew that it was very, you know, you're very meticulous. You want to make sure that the guys are going through everything. It's, you know, that there's a different type of tone at OTAs. I think, you know, the, he was a great coach when it talked about Bill, when I'm talking about Bill Parcells, the organization was different than the Saints. The Saints, yes, you had a tough coach, but at the same sense, you saw the different things starting to slip through. Attention to details. Maybe guys are, you know, paying attention as mo- much in meetings, but you still had the effort there. You know, with the Cincinnati Bengals, you know, Dick Bo, a great guy, didn't have 100%. Guys that you thought that would show up wouldn't. A, a great player, Hall of Fame type of player, Corey Dillon, wasn't going to be there all the OTAs, wasn't going to, you know, wouldn't be there. You know, of course, the mandatory mini camp, yes. But most of the time, Guys are there unless it's a conflict of a, you, an agent or you're trying to hold out for a bigger contract. So most of the times, OTAs and in in mini camps, guys are there unless, you know, it's a contract right. dispute or something like that. But for the most, you get 100%. Well, I'll tell you what's got 100% participation, Lo, and that is Bet Online. Number one source for the NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals this season, every stat, every matchup. Even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. U.S. Open's coming up here. So all of that is available at BetOnline. When the game's over, head over to the online casino. You can get in on a game of blackjack or poker, unwind with one of the over 150 slots games as well. So get to the website today. Get in on the action. Use the promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V. Again, that is B-L-E-A-V. It's a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposits. Take advantage of that. BetOnline. The game starts here. Uh, I got no problem, you know, celebrating and and having people say, oh, come on, you're just, you work for the Chargers. So, of course, you're going to celebrate them a ton. But uh, they went up to Camp Pendleton, and it looked fantastic. About 5,000 people out, military, military families. That's awesome. Jim Harbaugh was the last guy signing autographs. Justin Herbert was signing autographs for over an hour. The guys uh, allowed all the people to come on the field. Nick Hardwick was was obviously a very popular guy. Uh, Coach Hardwick now of the offensive line was out there taking a lot of photos with, with all those people down there. And unfortunately, because COVID, they stopped going uh, that, that first day of mandatory minicamp like they have for so many years. Um, and, and I think it's just worth kind of pointing out that it's great to have that tradition back and, and that connection with that particular group of people. And, awesome. and you hear the message that, that Coach Harbaugh shared with them. Yeah. And look, you don't have to do it. You know, it's getting on a bus and, and sitting on a bus for an hour and, and getting down to Camp Pendleton on the five south. Not the easiest uh, drag, especially in, in drive time traffic. But tip of the cap to to coach and and to the Chargers for making sure they got back to doing that because it is an awesome tradition. Man, money. We could do a whole show on that. I mean, being able to go on the aircraft carriers when you're there with the Chargers, being able to go to Camp Pendleton and just to show that, hey, we're a part of this community. What you guys do, we're grown men playing a kid's game, getting a king's ransom. You know, we can play this game and we can quit. We can walk off the field. We can retire. We do those things. We play a game. They're playing life. They're playing. They get putting their life on the line to protect us in this country. And for Coach Harbaugh to say, look, I'm going to go back to Camp Pendleton. And also in that community, the Chargers were ripped out of, you know, San Diego was unfortunate, but yeah. the things happened. But to say, no, I'm going to go back and say, we're going to say, we don't, we're not forgetting you. No man left behind to go to Camp Pendleton, to have that practice there. And I love Marty. That would, Marty Shonner would love to go there and be engaged in the military, be around these people. This is an awesome, awesome, awesome step for the Chargers and Harbaugh, getting back to that community, especially with the military. It's kudos to this organization, kudos to Harbaugh, kudos to this program that's saying, look, let's go to Camp Pendleton. Let's do a practice. Let's go sign autographs. Let's freaking get on this bus for an hour and a half, whatever it is. Let's go help make this place better off. And I love it. Yeah. And it was, uh, and it gave us, you know, selfishly the media an opportunity for more media, um, you know, kind of Q and a and pressers. And it was Harbaugh yesterday. So we're going to get all the big names this week. Derwin, Justin Herbert, Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, Jim Harbaugh, basically the, the five that, that you would want to hear from 
before they break for training camp. So we're going to get all those this week. It was Coach Harbaugh yesterday, and it started with uh, effusive praise. And, and I think this goes back to the conversation we were having a, a little bit earlier, a couple weeks ago, Low, that, you know, there's only one guy in a gold jersey. The, the, the other quarterbacks are wearing the same shade as the offense, white, but Herbert is in gold. And I think, you know, more of what Coach Harbaugh is trying to do in this relationship and in, in this sort of leadership role that he wants to see Justin, you know, how he wants Justin maybe to, to perform in that particular facet of being the quarterback of this team. I, I don't think there's any question. There's a reason why the majority of his presser was all about how impressed he is with Justin, how he's been fully committed, that, that he's in the facility every single day, that he just absolutely nailed the conditioning test and was arguably the best conditioned athlete out there and what that means for a team, you know, going into a season. Uh, I think the he was talking to Jim Hill, someone you know really well, uh, you know, legend here, the, uh, yeah. the, the, you know, the tenured, the longest tenured sports anchor in, in Los Angeles, 30 plus years now for Jim Hill. And, and he told him, he's like, I, you know, I wish I could, I would trade any one of my genes for any one of his genes. <laughs> Everything that he can do is better than anything I can do. And I just, I think there's a method to what he's doing and why there is so much of this for, for Justin Herbert from, from coach Harbaugh and sort of, you know, setting the stage for what his expectations are going to be, you know, on the 2024 campaign. No question. I, I think what a lot of people don't realize money and, and what Harbaugh is saying is, is, Hey, look, this guy's big, big as an ox. He could play tight end. He could play defensive end. Yeah. Of course, he can't play defensive end, but maybe tight end. He could play because his athletic ability. And you have guys like, you know, the, the Phillip Rivers, big Dan Marino, all these guys, great quarterbacks. Right. But if athletically, can they go out and Philip Rivers go out and run with the DBs? Can they go out and do those things? It's like, okay, you can still lead. You're still the leader. It's nothing wrong. You're still leader. You still have a press, but you have a quarterback that can compete, that can compete with these DBs, the receivers, running back that can run with them. That is great, just as good as condition, if not better. Harbaugh's talking about he's leading. Guys are trying to. So not just do you have a leader that is, can go out and have gravitas and demand respect and get guys lined up and throw the ball up country mile, do all those things. But guess what, though? I'm going to go run a 100-yard dash. I'm going to go run my drills yeah. with you. I'm getting ready to go run these 300s. And guess what? I'm going to compete with you. I'm going to push you. And if you're not careful, I'm going to beat you and destroy you. So what does that do for other guys that are like, man, this is the quarterback outworking me. This is the quarterback that can run these wind spins better than me. I'm telling you, when you have a guy that can not just talk the talk, but walk the walk, and not that other quarterbacks can't, you know, they don't have the athletic ability. They, they probably right. don't. But to be able to do it and push guys, trust me, guys even respect and look at that as just a little bit different. And that's what's great about this Herbert kid, that he actually has athletic ability to push guys around him. To say, guess what? I'm going to compete. I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah, and I think that's – it's something that Troy Dye said in his presser. You know, they were teammates at Oregon. He was asked about Herbert, the leader at Oregon. And and it was very similar to to what was described of him coming into the league. Some people took it as, as a little negative. Some people just took it as, yeah, that's just the way he operates. But he said, look, he leads by example. This is a guy that will push you to be your best because of how – he goes about his business and he does talk. He doesn't talk often. He's not a big rah-rah guy, but when he does, everybody shuts up and listens because they know that it's important and it's going to carry weight. And so I think that's just his MO, right? That's, that's how he operates. He would much rather go. And I think so much of it, and this is, you know, just me sort of extrapolating what I've experienced having been around him now for this will be the fifth year is you know, he just, he is really uncomfortable with praise and he, he's got incredible humility. And I think anytime you try to celebrate him, you can just see him sort of squirm a little bit yeah. and get uncomfortable. And, and I think when you start barking at teammates and you, you know, that sort of suggests, well, I'm, I'm on this, you know, pedestal and you're down here and I'm bark. And I just don't think that's not, I don't think that's comfortable for him. Now we've seen it. We saw him cuss out. Um, I think it was Will Clapp when he had an issue with the snap. Uh, so we saw a little bit of that. And after it happened, it became the talk of the postgame presser. Like, hey, 
how about that? You actually, uh, you, you snapped a little bit. You started barking out there. What was that? And he was really uncomfortable with it. So, you know, I, I do think all of this is setting him up to be, you are different. You know, I know you're not comfortable with it because even Coach Harbaugh, you know, had the pretext. He set up his comments by saying, look, he would not be happy that I'm saying these things right now. He goes, it would make him really uncomfortable to hear me say this. So I think he's trying to get him more comfortable. Uh, it's it, it, okay. It's all right to be celebrated. There's nothing wrong with it. You've earned it. Absolutely, money, and, and and that's what he has to continue to do. And it's great that this coaching staff is here because Harbaugh has to make him uncomfortable of being uncomfortable. Because, like you just alluded to, yes, hey, look, he doesn't want to necessarily get on guys. He's gonna because he knows he's human. He's gonna throw interception, and guys may not get on him. And he's like, look, but I get to get away with it, and you guys don't. That's not that. So he's looking at it as double standard hypocrisy, but it's not. You have to have a quarterback. Trust me, Drew Brees and I would, you know, drink a Coors Light and fill up rivers and we'll hang out on the back of the bus on the way home, you know, and and laugh and joke. But hey, look, let me run K4 and say, Lo, catch the ball. Lo, I'm not throwing it to you again. Or, you know, hey, look, make your block. Getting on guys. Come on, we, we, we're better than that. You have to do that. Right. A quarterback, he can still be kind and humble and humility, but at the same sense, you got to be, you got to turn into a lion. You can still be meek as a lamb, but then when you got to be a lion or be a bear, you have to because you have to carry that, and that's got to permeate through the locker room. You got to be a little selfish. You got to be able to get in guys' face and say, man, this isn't acceptable. Man, hey, what are you doing? And go and get in those guys' face. And guess what? Afterwards, money, after practice, you walk up to the guy and say, hey, man, Hey, sorry about that, but hey, but I got to do it. I expect more from you. And, and, and things go back to normal. Right. But Justin has to do that. If this team is going to have success and go where we believe that it can go, money, he has to make guys uncomfortable in spite of. Right. And and he does it with the play. I mean, you know, I, I was not happy with the the Chris Harris commentary, you know, that uh, a couple weeks ago about how he's not sure he's got the clutch gene in him. And I was like, wait a minute. You were on the team against the Raiders week 18. Uh, do you not remember that fourth quarter? Do you not remember converting, you know, four fourth downs, including a fourth and 18 to put that game into overtime where they probably should have ended with a tie and got into the postseason? That's if that's not clutch, I don't know what the heck is. I mean, that, that it's one of the most clutch performances I've ever seen in my life. That that final that that fourth quarter of that game in week 18, winning in, losing out. Uh, now, ultimately, they lost. I don't think that was necessarily on Justin it was perhaps the management of the game that got the best of them in that contest but um you know that he's got that part of it like there's right. no doubt that he's got the whole competition and fight till the end and and fight for every last inch you know in him it's it's the vocal part of it that I think coach Harbaugh is, is trying to bring out let's shift a little bit here low to the offensive line you know how important it is I mean heck coach has told us all off season how important it is and he did share yesterday that it looks like they've got their first group he says the first group has separated and it is Trey Trey Pipkin's going to kick inside from right tackle to right guard so left to right it's going to be Rashawn Slater first round pick Zion Johnson first round pick Bradley Bozeman who's been a starter in this league for a number of years, both Baltimore and Carolina. And he is huge for being a center. You're talking about a guy that's six foot six, you know, 325 pounds. So they've got a gigantic center. Trey, who is six foot five, 320 pounds is your right guard. And we obviously know Joe Alt's one of the biggest humans, one of the largest humans in the NFL already at right tackle. So that's their group. And and Harbaugh did not mince words. He said, I believe we can be one of the best, if not the best offensive line in the league. That is what his wow. expectations are. So he's already put it on those guys. Wow. And when you do that, that's to say, guys, what are we going to do about it? Because just because a coach, someone, you remember the famous line by Denny Green, you want to crown him? Crown him. Yeah. This is Harbaugh saying, look, I'm crowning you, but now what are you going to do? But there's the messages that he's sending money, and I think you and I would agree. I love it. I love what he's doing because he's putting the onus on God. He's saying, I believe. You listen to him. He said, hey, look, we're the I love the way we're going. I think we got expectations as high. We're setting the bar high. So now he's putting it on these guys. What are you guys going to do for these next six weeks to say that make we able to crown you? What right. are we going to do now to put the hay in the barn? We understand that this is the potential. Now, what are you going to do to make it become reality? That's what he's doing. You've been talking about it all year long, money. Last year, the year before, it's like Derwin James. You know, you look at what he's doing. You talk about, you know, him and, him and Herbert. 
Look at what Harbaugh said. The things that you're talking about, here are the leaders. Here are the guys that are working hard. Here's the guy that's pushing. You got one on offense, one on defense that are pushing the whole team. That's what you need. But the offensive line, that has to be the mainstay because it all starts when you got a multi-million dollar quarterback, you got a franchise quarterback, you have to protect him. And they believe they got the line to do it. Yeah. And, and you know, that's settled now. That's the only comment he made but if you just watch the practice on on Tuesday it was pretty evident it looks like the the starting corner group or the top three corners I should say if they're playing nickel looks like it's going to be Asante Samuel and Christian Fulton on the outside and and Ja Taylor right now is taking the reps with the ones in the slot so as and, and that's what we suspected of course your starting safeties are are Derwin and and Low Aloe Gilman. Uh, there's a fight for that third safety that might be the tightest competition in camp as it stands right now. The JT Woods, who's I think fair to say been a disappointment thus far after being a third round pick and leading the NCAA and in, in interceptions his senior year at Baylor, just has not been able to get on the field thus far. AJ Finley, the undrafted free agent who got who got a lot more reps really in rotation uh, last year than than Woods. So that th- because Derwin's been playing a little bit of slot corner, so when he kicks in. To, to that role, then you're going to have to get that second safety out there. Um, so that's a battle. And then it was interesting, and I think it's it's a product of of injury, right? You know, you got to be available in order to find yourself on the first team. But it's been Denzel Perriman and and Dan Henley as your starting linebackers, not not Junior Colson, but I think a lot of you know because we all talked about how he knows this defense. He was the leader of that defense. He's a plug and play guy. He'll probably start. So not the case as it stands. Right now, that, of course, can change. But I think that's going to be a much tighter competition than maybe some people thought between it looks like Dan's certainly going to be out there. It's just a matter of whether or not Junior can get healthy and show that that he's ready to go as a rookie as opposed to a 10 year vet like Perriman. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a great point, Money. And I think that you got Harbaugh saying, look, I can't just give it to this rookie. I understand he knows the system. He knows it better. And he's probably going to be my guy. But now you slide him in. You say, look, start. You start the veteran guys. And it's going to take time for him to move in there. But like you said, doing training camp. And Harbaugh alluded to that. He goes, look, some of these things are obvious. Who's going to be our starter? Right. And he goes, but some of these things we can't determine until we put on the pads. Until we put on a big pad and we start cracking some leather, and that's when you step, separate a lot of people. Because I've seen guys go out there, and you've seen it, money. You've been around this game a long time. You've seen guys built like Tarzan and play like Jane. You put the lights on, and you put the cameras on, and you say put the pads on, and guys are running for cover. So you get exposed when you put those pads on. And you start popping a little bit of leather, and someone says, "Okay, let's get downhill and let's see what you're working with." Oh, let me try to get out of the way. That's what I like. I like when you say, "Show me what you're working with, baby." Put them pads on and let. Right make the noise and that's and that's you know just speaking to the trey pipkins thing that's when we're really going to find out you know there's no pads on right now but once you get the pads on find out whether or not trey is comfortable playing inside and playing guard as opposed to to tackle and like you said you put the pads on. i'm excited to see dan henley with pants on you know i wish yeah. we would have seen him more last year he was dealing with a hammy but for whatever reason just could not crack that rotation that the linebacking level is going to be exciting um i you know it was a weakness I thought last year, even with all the experience of Eric Kendricks and Kenneth Murray, I thought that particular position group let down more than it delivered. I'm excited to see the shakeup there. Um, just a couple quick things to to get through here. Um, wide receivers always go. You know what? Let's just go to, well, one, uh, the Rams announced that they're going to have joint practices with the Chargers, two days of, of joint practices um, or two sessions of joint practices with the Chargers. So that's been been settled. We got that from from Sean McVay. Um, So we'll kind of figure out, you got five teams here in Southern California that are practicing the saints, the Raiders, the chargers, the Rams, and the Cowboys. You got plenty of teams you can have joint practices with, without having anybody to fly out here, needing to fly out here without them having to go anywhere as it stands right now. Don't know how Jim Harbaugh wants to do that. Maybe he wants to take the team on the road for three, four days and just kind of get them settled into some sort of road schedule away from home, being around each other. Don't know. But as it stands right now, we know, that they are going to uh, that they're going to play the ramps uh, a little bit in some joint practices. Uh, Lindsay, our producer, put together a bunch of comments. So, uh, or she correlated a bunch of comments from YouTube, uh, from our YouTube page. So, if you want to hit us up there, of course, this isn't just a pod, but it's also a video. Big thank you to our, our friends at Bally's, uh, Bally's West, who run this thing all the time. Um, but so we get a lot of interaction with the people, and would love to kind of get through some of them. So we'll just start low and and kind of run through these real quick 
Uh, let's see, Ryan. Question is: Gus Edwards attended OTA. Has he attended OTAs these last couple few years in Baltimore? Uh, Ryan, I think just I'll answer that one real quick. Low. I think it's just more individual, right? Well, we'll find out. But he was not, you know, he was working off to the side. So to me, it looks like maybe there is some health thing there, and uh, he's there now. This is the mandatory portion, and they got 100 percent participation. I don't. I don't know how big of a deal it would be to you, Lo, that, that he was not there for the voluntary, but came out for the mandatory, and you know he's here. Yeah, and, and, and I think it would be a big deal if you heard something. Harbaugh would kind of call it out. I think it's a situation where he's definitely had clearance because you, you're not just going to – you just sign with a new team. Yeah. You're going to call. I guarantee the running back coach knows Harbaugh. Knows, the guy's just not going to show up. So I think that it would be foolish us to just think that, oh, he's just not showing up. He's not calling. He's not communicating. No way. That chance is slim to none, and none has left the building. Guarantee he's communicated with the team. Yeah, yeah. and we'll hopefully – Figure it out in the next two days. I don't know. He's not going to be making it available for, for media, so that'll just be something we'll have to try to dig out. Um, all right, so this is uh, what are our current deficiencies as you see them? Can they be fixed after training camp cuts are made? Is there anything, any particular position group that you're kind of keeping your eye on low that you think they may have to uh, to add a little bit to? Yeah, I think this. I think the secondary is something we you look at, and you always got to look at the secondary, especially with now we're in a league. You know, now it's a pass happy league, and and people want to throw the ball first before they think about running. You know, so you have to make sure your secondary is going to be solidified. So I think without a doubt, you will see some people come in and out, especially at the secondary position, a cornerback, a safety. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. And you can see this team always trying to build bolster in the trenches. But I think that if you said, hey, if you had one position that you look at and say, what would be the question mark? I would think it'd be the secondary. Yeah, I'd add interior line to that as well, just because we don't, you know, Tito was not healthy. You know, he, he hurt himself midway through his rookie season, you know, two years ago, two seasons ago. Last year, never quite got back to a level where he was getting a lot of snaps out there. So even though he started flashing his rookie season and was earning more and more snaps, I think he's going to have to come along. We know Morgan Fox tends to be a little bit more situational, interior pass rusher type. We heard from Coach Mike Elston, who coaches the interior defensive line, say that their fourth-round pick, Justin Avoigby, is, is a project. It's it's a guy that they're going to have to develop. Then you got Scott Matlock out of Boise State that, that we did not get a chance to see a whole lot of. Last year, they have a number of undrafted free agents that are still on the 90 man as it stands right now. So to me, that's one that I would keep an eye on, you sure. know, based on on cuts, you know, but uh, you hit the secondary for sure, specifically safety, the entire secondary. But and you can always use help there. I would add interior defensive line to that as well uh, what was very thin is is now us trying to figure out how the numbers are going to work in the wide receiver room so i'd go i'm with you d tackle one interior defensive line would be number two uh this from ed he's not letting up low he will not stop the, what, what, the, ed Vidal, about? The, the videl shout out at the beginning made my day even if you keep butchering it i'll always have your back now I'll wow. <laughs> Ed, be easy on money. Ed, be easy on money. I'll just add this, Ed. When you call a game, they give you a, they give you a weekly media packet. And that weekly media packet is a pronunciation guide. It's a full page <laughs> of how every player wants you to say their name spelled out phonetically. So I would imagine when you got, you know, when you got your packet that Kamani – K U H dash M A N I, and then the next word for V I D A L, which you think is Vidal, says <laughs> capitals, all capitals, V Y E, Vi dash small D E L L. That's probably what it says, which is why every one of these play by play guys is saying Vidal instead Giddy of Vidal. money. Giddy money. Don't let him off that. Put that, that in your. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Ed. <laughs> yes. They, they give you – this is how the player would like it. I remember, you know, I, I called a bunch – I called a handful of Wisconsin games for for Monty Ball. You know, I called a, a lot of those Wisconsin Badger games when he was on the team. And it was exactly – and I was like, wait a minute. I, I got the game notes. It says Monty. M-O-N-T-Y. Monty. Monty Ball. He gets into the league. It's Monte. 
It's like, oh, my day. <laughs> why don't you help us out here? Eh, help us out, man. You know, <laughs> just tell me. I got no problem. I got, I was calling Michigan, Iowa. I'll never forget it. Uh, Michigan, Iowa, in Iowa City at Kinnick. And I've got, the, and, and I've got the game notes. And I know because the family's from Southern California that Tate, want that the name is Forcier there they pronounce their last name Forcier but his brother was already a quarterback I think people started calling him Forcier and he just let it slide and Tate never corrected him but in the game notes it says Forcier so I'm calling him Forcier <laughs> I'm getting blown up on my phone at halftime from the the you know from Michelle who runs the executive producer of, of the network she's like hey we're getting a bunch of emails that you're butchering this game you keep calling the quarterback Forcier I'm like Shell, that's his name. She's like, well, give me a favor. Just call him Four CA. Will you just play? I'm like, no, it's in the that's what he wants to be called. It's in the game notes. Tate Four I'm sorry. So they, don't, they don't know money that you got swag. See, a lot of people outside, they're like, oh, you're butchering the name. They don't understand. Guys want a little swag. They want to add a little twist to it. They don't right. understand. Do you say Wisconsin or Wisconsin? Well, no, I, so it's interesting, you know, where I was, was raised. They, I don't know why they do it in Chicago. They put an extra N in. Right. So with the Chicago accent, they say, you going to go up to Wisconsin? <laughs> you going to go up there? When are you guys going? You're going to go, I'll go with you. You want to get some cheese up there and we'll get a couple, we'll get some of the spotted cow and we'll bring that back and we'll get some curds. I don't know why. Like, where's the N in? It's W-I-S. Where does Wisconsin come from? Um, yeah. No, thankfully my God awful accent was left in the dust probably halfway through my college career, I was able to shed it until I go home. And the next thing you know, I sound like, Dad, we going for a couple, two, three beers? we we'll go out tonight? <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah, three becomes tree. They add ends. There's right. no there's no consonants. It stops at a vowel. Mom is ma. It's right. just, right. it's, it's, it's an ugly, it's an ugly dialect. Um, born in Detroit, Lions in Michigan always be my teams, but low is 100% right. Rooting for the Chargers because my coach is leading the powder blue. Yeah, you mentioned that, 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 Harbaugh is such a powerful force that he makes fans for life. No question. No question. And, and we, we're happy to have him, and he's going to do great here. So this one's uncomfortable to start with. This duo, my gosh, a match made in heaven. Thank you, uh, Tay Jack. <laughs> we appreciate you. However, there is an addendum. There is a PS. There is a postscript. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Q will have to prove he can catch with his hands, be more physical when pressed by CB cornerbacks. Also, Ladd is getting a lot of praise. Let's see it week one preseason. Lastly, with the running backs being out, I'm taking it as they're looking out for more, or I don't know what that is. It says read more, but there isn't. Um, so anyway, yeah, look, I think the wide, we talked about it. The wide receiver room is now deep. There's some depth, and and the depth chart is going to be interesting. Lad caught another four balls yesterday, and he's working primarily out of the slot. He is, you've heard what the coaches say, Lo, he is an expert route runner, and he is, he is going to do some damage this year, fantasy folks. So feel free to draft him in those late rounds, get incredible value. He could end up being the highest targeted receiver this season. It would not surprise me one bit. He's Keenan. He's going to be the new Keenan. Yeah. I, you look at the guy where he has in the slot, you're talking about how they go to him. The coaches talk about impressed with his route run and his ability to understand how he stems, how he stems the DBs getting in and out of his breaks. He's a precise route runner. When you hear all these things, these acclimates that these coaching staff is given Vlad's going to be pro. He's going to be great. Yeah, and there's a lot of wide receivers. Understandable, right? Like the wide receivers are – it's it's what the league is now. It's throw and catch. I'm not a QJ hater. This is from Carlos. Uh, wide receiver room's crowded. Uh, if I had to pick between QJ getting a second chance or keeping Rice to give him his first, I'd pick Rice. Eh, let's, let's not get crazy. There's <laughs> – you know, I, I get what you're saying, Carlos, but we definitely have not seen enough from Q. I mean, you're, you're talking about a very right. small sample size from a coaching staff that well, I, I was about to say I'm not taking a shot, but I guess I kind of am, that just did not use him right. He, that, that, that is not what they asked him to do to replace Mike Williams – looks nothing like what he was able to do to excel in college. That's just not what he, he was not an outside receiver running nine routes, tracking the ball over his shoulder and, and winning in contested catches. He was quick hitters slants and had explosion after he would catch the ball. It's a ton of, yeah, he was the number one yak receiver in college. And that is just not how they use him. So I think it is nowhere near that. That book is not finished. The first chapter has been written. There's a heck of a lot more, that we're going to get to sort out before you want to write off someone like Quentin Johnston with all that talent, size, athleticism that he has. 
Yeah, I think that they will. They they won't. And the coaching staffs understand that. And, that. and that's what we talked about. And that's what everyone. And that's why they brought in a guy like Harbaugh. He understands positions, but he understands what guys can do. This is what you alluded to, Money. He's going to look at the talent and say, this is what this guy does well. He is a number one receiver running slants. He is a number one receiver running quick outs. He's not a number one receiver running nine routes. He's a three or a four or a five. So when you understand the, the chemistry and what this team is trying to do, people are going to quickly understand and they're going to quickly see what Harbaugh is doing. He's adapting to players saying, I'm going to put them in position where they are going to be stars. I'm not going to ask them to do things that they don't do well. And, and, you know, our, you hear it all the time, you know, wide receiver room is a basketball team. You need, you need all five positions and chart can be your outside, you know, run and go routes, press coverage, knocking it out guy. McConkey can be your point guard, your jitterbug. That's going to, you know, move around guys. are going to have struggle to keep up with him to chase him. He's going to be able to break him down off the drill, you know, and Josh Palmer is, is sort of your, he's the, and here's, this is from uh somewhat solo. Uh, who will be, who will have the best season of our top three? Don't forget about Palmer. I think he could break out as our X. We need lots going on down low. Yeah. I think he, Josh has played everywhere. Josh has played slot. He's played X. He's played Z. He's excelled when he's been asked to step in for Mike to step in for Keenan when they've been hurt. Josh is the number one. I, I don't think there's any question about that. No, Josh is definitely number one. He's going to he's gonna step up and he's going to excel. So I know people want to say, oh, God, here's the other guy's going to push you. No, Josh is going to be number one. He's going to step up. And you got to realize, sometimes you're looking for that opportunity. Other guys are gone now. Keenan's gone. A lot of guys are just, out. So now you, Mike's gone. When you have an opportunity, sometimes receivers step up and say, they're expecting a lot more out of me. Let me step up and take my rightful place and show these young guys how to lead. Yeah, I think the one thing with Josh, too, is – He's made clutch catches. I mean, clutch catch. Think about the Raider game last year. Yeah. The, 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 you know, that 50 yard bomb left sideline that he tracks down to end the game on third down. Otherwise, they would have had to punt. And game was starting to get away from a little bit there at the start of the season. So, yeah, like he's, he's clutch. He's big. He's bigger than you think. He's a legitimate six foot three. And he can play all three spots very easily. He's going to be on the field as long as, and that's, it's just health. Health has dogged him. And if he can get over that, he's going to have a big season going into a, a contract year, which is going to be great for the Chargers. It works either way. You know, you, you sign them to, uh, to a deal after that as your number one, or you get your comp pick and you end up getting a third out of it. And QJ is, and you know, Quentin's ready to step up. McConkey becomes a, an incredible target for Herbert and you, and you grow, you know, and that's, that's, you can't keep everyone. So Wide receiver group is going to be fun to watch. And certainly we're going to hear from Herbert a little bit later this week, get into that. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how much more clarity we're going to have now. It's going to be a gnarly battle though. It is going to be a fun battle in that room to see how that thing shakes out with these rookies, Cornelius Johnson, Brennan Rice, both drafted for a reason. Uh, Darius Davis, Lad McConkey, Chark, and Josh Palmer. That's a, that's a lot of dudes. That is a, and Simi Fajoko, who was on the active roster five, six weeks last year. So you had a deep room competition. What does coach say? Competitors are welcome. So um, that's pretty much this week. That's, uh, that's all the comments. We appreciate Lindsay for curating those. And we mentioned the, the joint practices with the Rams that we now know. We got a couple more practices left. So we'll be able to recap those. We'll have heard from Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa and Justin Herbert and Derwin James by the next time we check in. And, and then we'll have, Six weeks of probably a lot of front office, maybe some maneuvering, some signings, some movement. As Joe Ortiz has said repeatedly, low that you're always looking. You're always looking and trying to figure out if you can get better. No question. You have to. If you want, especially if you're trying to win in this particular league, you cannot just sit idle and say, okay, we got our team. You're constantly banging phones and seeing, getting guys in and working guys out to say, hey, look, if guy go down, next man up. So Joe Ortiz is going to keep that type of mentality. All right, Low. That's uh, it's gonna do it for us. Rap. I'm gonna practice my kick out and wheels, get out from that down position. <laughs> and we ain't gonna get you pinned anymore, man. You're not. No, you're coming me. out of retirement. We got even one, 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 one match, one more wrestling match at you. Oh, they would. <laughs> that, that that ref would have that hand, and he'd be like, yep. and I would turn around and run. <laughs> turn around and run. See you later. <laughs> In my singlet, my headgear, <laughs> my knees. You know what I will do though. 
I'll watch. I'll watch Vision Quest. I'll, there we I'll, go. I'll watch, Great I'll watch movie. Quest. It's one of my Great favorite, one of my top five favorites of all time. Oh, it's legendary. It's timeless. Uh, Loud and Swain, shoot <laughs> the best. Shoot, shoot. Yeah. See, you can go out. You can see. There it is, Lo. You're the yes. guy with the railroad tie on your shoulder, <laughs> walking the bleachers. I'm the guy studying biology in the kitchen <laughs> with a red velvet jacket on, <laughs> bleeding from my nose because right, of an iron right, deficiency because right. I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, for checking in. Remember, please rate and uh, comment if you don't mind, just so we can keep growing this thing.